Hello everyone and welcome back to Age of Nagash which is a channel dedicated to Age of Sigma and in this video I am very excited as we are actually going to be talking about the Ogre Moor tribes which is an army I would love to cover more on the channel as I've only made two videos for them and they don't seem to have loads of content out there and I say that because I always get asked by uh, Ogre Moor Shrive fans for me to make more content for them. So great to see that they happen to have won my last poll for a Y Play video. Funny that. But in this particular video, focusing on the Ogre Moor Tribes, we'll be talking about Y Play the Thunderbellies, which is a sub allegiance for the Ogre Moor Tribes. And if you're particularly new to Age of Sigma and you're wondering what is a sub allegiance, essentially, once you pick your army, most armies then have. A few sub allegiances for you to pick. So essentially, you've picked your allegiance, Ogre Moor tribes, and now you can pick a second set of rules by picking which tribe you want to come from. And in this one, like I say, we'll be doing Y Play Thunderbellies. And in case you haven't seen a previous Y Play, the objective of this video is to go over the strengths and weaknesses of this sub allegiance and to try and help you to make up your mind if you want to play Thunderbellies. Now, the nice thing about doing these Y Play videos for a sub allegiance is it tends to mean that you've already bought into the army or you've already decided you want to play um, Ogre Moor Tribes. And if you haven't, please, at the end of this video, go check out my Y Play Ogre Moor Tribes for a more sort of talk on the whole army as a whole. In this video, we are just going to be talking about the Thunderbellies in particular. And to start, we're going to be talking about their lore. So, they are one of the youngest Moor tribes and they come from their homeland in the center of the Sky Rose of Shaman, the realm of metal. And the reason why they got this extraordinary name called the Thunderbellies is due to their Everwinter curse. And if you're wondering what is the Everwinter curse, essentially what it is it's a curse that the Beast Claw Raiders have, which takes the form of an extraordinary powerful weather condition, which sounds a little bit funny, but usually what it is is like a massive snowstorm that comes and covers the land from wherever the Beast Claw Raiders go because it follows behind them as if it's actually chasing the Beast Claw Raiders. But in the case for the Thunderbellies, their Everwinter curse actually takes the form of a mighty lightning tempest which you can kind of now guess where the thunder part of their name comes from. So this fearsome tempest is also the quickest form of which the Everwinter takes. So it's not a snowstorm or anything like that, it's this lightning thunder. Imagine just like a massive storm in the sky, right? But Age of Sigma, so you know, chuck some steroids into it. Huge, powerful, and is also the fastest as well. And this is really actually quite interesting now, because this means that the ogres of the Thunderbellies reason for why these ogres have to always constantly be on the move to make sure that they do not themselves fall too far into this tempest which follows them. This is why these ogres, to help them with this dilemma of death by storm, ride mighty mounts, with the mightiest of the Moor tribe riding stone horns and thunder tusks. However, the Thunderbellies also boast the most Mournfangs that any Moor tribe has. This is because the breed of Mournfang of the Sky Road have always been used to the Tempest and have somewhat became part of it. So as they are able to absorb the thundering power of the Tempest, this makes their fur and skin to be pulsing with lightning energy and makes them even deadlier to fight if you are so unlucky to come across one. So as particularly nasty these beasties can be in a fight, the Thunderbellies don't actually just use their mounts to take them to the next battle and to help them with the fight, but practically never dismount them, as they have to always be so fast and on the move that they do not even have time to set up camp as the storm will essentially just catch up with them and it's bad news for the Thunderbellies. So they always have to eat on the go as well, and they do this by skewering their prey with their mighty weapons, then attaching them to their saddles to be eaten on the move. And as we mentioned that this is mainly a Beast Claw Raider uh, more tribe, you do also have the Gut Busters as well, you know, quite a lot of the time they're working alongside each other, but even the few Gut Busters that are part of the Thunderbellies have to ride beasts to battle to be able to escape the full might of the Tempest, because if the Beast Claw Rega segment of the Thunderbellies struggles to deal with the Tempest that chases them, you can guarantee that the Gustbusters that aren't 
as used to the Tempest, as they are, are going to die a lot sooner. So they have to ride beasts, but when they actually get to battle, they have to dismount because if you look at iron guts and everything like that, in the model's terms, they're on foot, right? But also the Thunder Bellies do not see the Gut Busters as worthy enough to use mounts into battle, which I think is pretty interesting to know as well. So now that we've talked about how much of a problem the Tempest can be for the Thunder Bellies, it's got a double-edged sword to it, right? So as much as a threat it is to the Thunder Bellies' survival, this Tempest, they also weaponize it by using it to make their mounts and beasts of burden faster and unleashing the power of the Tempest upon their enemies. There is no other more tribe as fast as the Thunderbellies, which I think is pretty cool, as Ogres just being fast is just a very fun thing to think about. And when those who stand against the Thunderbellies look out from their settlements and fortifications along the Sky Road, all they see is a storm like no other, and hear the sound of lightning so loud it could burst a mortal's eardrums. However, the closer the storm gets, the lightning is not the only sound they can hear, but now the roars of relentless hunger from the ogres and their beasties. As you know, these brutes are very hangry people, aren't they? As you know, the unlucky thing for the Beast Corps Raiders is they're kind of double cursed. They've got this like eternal hunger, and then they also have this storm that's chasing them. So you can feel sorry for them if you would like to. And imagine if you're watching this video, you're kind of an ogre fan, you are going to. But before we feel sorry for them, let's actually talk about what they're like when they get to the fight. So when the defenders against the Thunder Bellies set up their battle lines, they are no sooner broken by the bone-crushing charge of these lightning mournfang. Bodies fly in all directions, butchered and cindered. When the defenders try to fall back to their second defensive position, it is no use, as they are run down by the impossibly fast, brutal beasts. When the Thunder Bellies claim victory, they do not stop to cook their newfound fresh meat. As thanks to their lightning mounts, when they get knocked over and obviously cindered from these essentially like lightning infused mournfang, uh, you know, it cooks them already. So it's a time saver. So it really does help them out, which I think they really do appreciate. And probably is the reason for why mournfangs tend to win the employee of the month for a month's on end. And so because they don't have to spend that time cooking, they actually spend that time quickly patrolling the battlefield, staying on their mounts to pick up with their weapons any worthy meat they may have missed in their charge. For they do not have long until the Tempest will soon be upon them and turn the hunter into the prey. So now that we know that how the Thunder Bellies fight and everything else, what is their purpose? What are they trying to achieve? What is their goal? Now, in Destruction, this is always quite funny because um, they always just seem to be up for a laugh or they're hungry, and that's kind of how you decipher between green skins and ogres, right? But the uh, motivation for the Thunder Bellies um, is to stick to the Sky Road of Shimon, which were once forged by the smith god Grongi, the sky roads twist around the high places and mountains of Shimon, and the Thunderbellies believe these roads to be the twisting bowels of their god Gorkamorka, and also believe that if they reach the end of this infinite appearing road, they will reach the mouth of their god and be given a seat at his table to feast for all eternity. What I think is a pretty good motivation, I mean, you know, that's going to get you up in the morning, isn't it? Especially when there's a raging storm behind you that wants to kill you. So what I also found interesting is the Thunder Bellies see the Dragon Ogres as corrupted rivals, and they will slay any who they come across without hesitation, which makes sense, right? Because the Dragon Ogres, which come from the Thunderscorn part of the Beast of Chaos, they're Ogres, right? Mixed with the Dragons, and I know they weren't always like that, and it wasn't chaos that mutated them into that form, but they're corrupted nonetheless by chaos, right? And obvious rivals, the dragon ogres are all about lightning, kind of half ogres, and then the ogre moor tribe of the Thunderbellies want to show that they are the boss of lightning. And with that, the coolest thing beyond anything else of the Thunderbellies is that they actually really like Stormcast. And you may be wondering, why do I think that's a good thing? I hate Stormcast. And that's because... They are their favourite prey, 
as the Thunderbellies actually see the storm cast um, as delicious lightning-infused meat. So those who within the Mole Tribes blessed with power of the Tempest are even rumoured to be able to trap the souls of the Stormcast upon their death and use this to power their Tempest ability. So, you know, like improving the Mormfang's strength, improving their beast strength, improving their resistance to the actual Tempest itself, etc. And I think that's really quite cool and shows that they actually can kind of play a part in the Soul Wars as well, to some extent. So that's also going to be the end of the lore segment of uh, this part of the video, which, to be honest, this has gone over longer than most of the lore I do for these Y plays, but I thought it would be really nice to dive into a certain Moor tribe of the uh, Okamore tribes because, like I said, I haven't put up too much content for them, so I thought it'd be really quite nice to look into their lore as a, low, a lot of people have been waiting for it. And yeah, I tell you what, absolutely laugh these guys, and I think they have great fun at lore there, and it's nice to see that they are quite different, and it's not always, you know, it's a perfect example watch those. Ah, oh, I, I really like the ideas of the Beast Core Raiders, but let's say you're not a huge fan of, you know, the winter theme. There you go, fantastic, you know, make puddles everywhere, I don't know. The other thing you can do is, because after the Ogamore tribes of the Thunderbellies have actually finished their battle, and the reason why they've got to be on the move again, and they're thinking, what about they've left some enemies behind, which, you know, are going to come and attack them in the rear when they go further down their sky road. What actually will happen is that the Tempest that's obviously behind the Beast Core Raiders will just scorch the earth of anything um, they left behind, which is quite a cool setting, right? Because you can imagine this sky road that, you know, winds and twists through the high places, like I said, of Shimon. If you look at it, it's like, you know, beautiful and gristling, you know, it's made by Grungi himself or however you pronounce it. But if you look for where the Thunderbellies are, Behind them, this road is just scorched and ruined everything else. So it's almost just like this line that's going up this sky road that's just absolutely not destroying it, but just scorching it really, really badly and just, you know, transforming it as they go, which I think is quite nice. It's like I do, I was hesitating there because I was going to use like corrupting this road, but they're not corrupting it, they're just. Uh, Cinder in it, I suppose, is the way to say it. But I think it's quite cool. If you're asking me, like, oh, how are they all fitting on this road in the sky? Imagine it's a very big road, right? There's even, like, kingdoms and everything else they come across on it. So it's a huge uh, construction, this thing, which I think is really quite cool, right? And uh, gives you quite opportunities to do their basing. So you can have, at the front, it's nice, like, beautiful stone as an example, as... I imagine this was made to be a beautiful road and then behind them is all scorched or you can do something like that. It just gives you lots of opportunities, especially if you let's say you go, I don't want to base them on snow. And and this is just one of the examples you can have it as it's like a, I don't know, a firestorm behind them or a sandstorm or, you know, like a, a mist or something coming from a enchanted forest, you know. The list goes on and on, right? Which is also going to lead into my next bit. So in these Y play videos, like I said, I do the strengths and weaknesses of the army. Now I do also talk about the strengths off the table as I think that's very important and not very often done. So what do I mean by strengths off the table? And this is really coming down to the hobby aspect. So you talk about the model range. So for Thunderbellies in particular, obviously you could talk about Ogres as a whole and Ogre more tries, but for the Thunderbellies, it's definitely more of the Beast Claw Raider side. And in particular, it's going to be things like Mornfang packs and stuff like that. Obviously, Stonehorns and Thunder Tusks can have a place as well. But your model choices, it's probably, obviously you can put in what you want, but to make the most of the Thunderbellies, it's going to be quite streamlined to probably about three or four different war scrolls of units. However, what I will say is this is actually quite a good thing because the start collecting box for Beast Claw Raiders, which is, you know, effectively the Ogre Moor Tribe start collecting box, was so really aimed towards you as you're getting plenty of Mornfang and you're also getting your Stonehorn. And you may be wondering, well, if I build the Stonehorn, obviously I haven't got the Thunder Tusk. What I will tell you is that literally you could kind of buy this Star Collecting Box three times and then you kind of have an army, like a 2,000 point army, and it would pretty much work as well, especially in this sub-allegiance being the Thunderbellies. The models, I absolutely feel they're fantastic. They're my favourite Ogre Moor Tribe models. I really love the monstrous, you know, mounted units. And who doesn't like an ogre on top of, you know, an enormous rhino-type 
beast. I know it's not a rhino, it's like it's kind of the tusks it has comes out of its mouth rather than a big horn. It's not a rhinox, but you see what I'm trying to say. And then even something on top of a stone horn or like a mammoth creature being the thunder tusk. Really, really cool things, right? Really nice models, and they I think they stood the test of time, particularly coming into Age of Sigma. So the model range is cool, you can be quite limited if you want to make the most out of your Thunder Bellies, but, you know, that's a uh, decision you make, and particularly in, like, sub legions Y plays, you know, a lot of the sub legionses are probably going to be quite restricted in what models you can take to make the most out of them. Admittedly, if you look at the uh, Y play Live in Cities we did shortly, on the last Y play video, huge range of models you can have, this one a lot less. That's kind of a weakness there. But for me, I don't really see it as a problem as that star collecting box is great value for you to get this army up and going and literally just to uh, buy that box a few more times and there's your army. So then the next thing I want to talk about, and I've kind of mentioned it already, and that's the painting and building sort of part of it and theme in your army. And as I've already mentioned, you don't have to base your guys with snow bases or anything like that. It doesn't have to be a snowstorm that's chasing them. It can, in this example, be a thunder bellies. It can be... Like I said, a blacking ground, that sort of thing. It can be like they're corrupting going across their base, but, you know, it's not chaos corruption or anything. It's just, you know, the storm, essentially. Or you can have it as it's just pools of rainwater, obviously, from when all the rain's been hitting the ground as part of the uh, the storm. You can really go um, crazy, and it gives you an excuse to break away from the norm. What I will say is that if you're going to go, oh, well, I really like, you know, the snowy theme, and I feel like if I go with these guys, I can't do it. Of course you can do it, right? You can literally go like, I don't know, Currently on the sky road they're going through, it's a freezing cold place, right? That means that it slowed down the storm, but they've had to slow down as well. So they're in this place for a very long time for you to be able to base your army around it, if you like. And this place is so cold. So actually what it's done is turn the, the rain from the storm to snow, right? And then you could even have um, like patches of blackened snow. Don't know, actually know how that works, but let's just say lightning hits the snow and it's blackened. Pretty sure that's not how the science works. But in Age of Sigma, you know, the world's your oyster, right? Or the mortal realms are your oyster, so you can have a lot of fun doing that. There are a lot of skin tones that paint in this army. and You may be thinking, I really don't want to paint up skin tones. It's not something I'm comfortable with. I'd rather do something a bit easier. Trust me, the nice thing about painting up skin tones in Ogre Moor tribes is that the models are bigger. Because, let's face it, we're all going to have to paint up skin tones probably one day. And you might as well start on something with a big skin, which, you know, it's easier to do. Bigger models, less models as well in Thunder Bellies. You know, that's another great thing, right? I love elite armies. One of the most elite armies you can get right here. Fewer models to paint, you can spend more time on those models. Which can help your skin tone practicing. And also, like, I don't want to use it in a bad way, but, you know, they're quite grubby models. And what do I mean by that? They're ogres, right? They don't wash every day. So, you know, like, if you paint up their skin and then you accidentally leave, like, a... I don't know, there's, like, a darkened spot on their skin. You know, it's a freckle. It's a bit of dirt. It's a mole. You can get away with that sort of stuff in the army, which is really quite nice. Alternatively, if you've been playing for a while and you're like, oh, I don't want to, you know, do this army just to say that, you know, it's an easy painting army... You can really take it to the next level as well. You can, like for skin, for example, if you're new, you can use contrast, right? You can really take it to the next level. Spend ages layering. I've seen some fantastic painted uh, Ogre Moor tribes or Ogre Kingdoms back then, armies in my time. So, yeah, that's what I'd say the strengths are off the table. And obviously, you've got some weaknesses in there as well. Like I said, you're limited in, you know, model choice. There hasn't really been any new models at all for the Ogre Moor tribes, apart from a Moor pot, I believe the scenery piece was called for them, and then you've got your Ogre Tyrant, right? Which don't really actually fit well into the Thunder Bellies, because on a narrative sense, you can have gutbuster units, but like, it's mainly based around all the basic or Raider stuff, right? And then the, the pot, who's dragging that thing? You literally are running around from this storm, right? You're running away from it, how is that being dragged? So if you want to take it, I think it'd be really cool if you had it being dragged by a stone horn. You may go, well, how is that going to work? You know, because then you're altering the size of the scenery piece and everything else. How is that going to be legal? Probably it won't be legal, but I'd put it on a base and have it dragged by the stone horns. I think that would be a lot cooler. And then, I don't know, if I was going to a tournament, email the tournament organizer and say, you know, am I all right to take this? Um, it's a conversion, everything like this. And if, you know, worst case scenario, they go, no. Your Moor pot is good, but it's not detrimental to your army. 
unless you build it in a certain way, which the Thunder Buddies aren't. So, yes, I'd I'd say that would be a really cool conversion idea, but, you know, then again, it doesn't really matter too much. So going back to the point I was going to make is that there hasn't really been any new models for uh, Ogre More Tribes. Probably won't be any new models, at least not for a long time. Hopefully I'm wrong, but at least not for a long, long time. So if you're looking for new model armies, probably not really for you. Um, but what I will also say, to so caveat that, is that the models stand the test of time, right? I mean, you may find there's a few more mold lines in these guys than some of the others, but I think the uh, Beast Core Raider stuff, basically the mounted versions of the Ogres, I think they are newer models compared to some of the other like gut buster units, should we say, like you don't have any resin heroes apart from the Ice Brow Hunter. I understand he's one, but he's not really essential. Probably the only resin you're going to have to deal with in this army is if you want to take a butcher or something like that in your army. So now that we've gone over the strengths and weaknesses of the army off the table, now let's actually talk about the juicy part of how is his army on the table and its strengths and weaknesses. So the first thing I'll say, this sub legions, the Thunderbirds, all about Mournfang. If you want to run a lot of Mournfang, this is the one for you. That is how I see it in my personal opinion, as I see this is the one that buffs up your Mournfang to the uh, at most best level. So why do I say that? Firstly, you get a lot of inherent buffs to your Mournfang just by picking the sub legions. So I've asked to read through some of them. And when I read through these, you'll also see a picture of them will appear on the screen now. So you can read along with me if you'd like to. I've just taken this picture with my iPhone, so apologies if it's a bit too blurry for you to read. But don't worry, I'll read it all out to you. So the first one, which is Swift Outflank. So friendly Thunder Benny Mournfang pack units wholly within 12 inches of the edge of the battlefield at the start of your charge phase can charge in that charge phase even if they ran in the same turn. So what this means is that you can run in charge with your um, Mornfang pack. Admittedly, you have to be close to the board edge, right? Which is a pain. That is absolutely true. I won't try and hide that. You've got big bases, so I want to say you want to have units of probably no bigger than four. If you want to try and run like bigger units than that, go ahead. I'm sure it's going to be fun, but I'd say units of four. So it's manageable, right? Holy within 12 inches. Some of the board edge stuff you get in this game are wholly within like six inches. So wholly within 12 isn't too bad. It should give you enough flexibility. And um, the other thing you get, so Riders of the Hurricane, so add one to prayer rolls for a kneeing gale when a Thunderbelly priest is chanting that prayer. So I'm going to go to that prayer now. This won't be on the screen now, but I'll just quickly read it out. So when it comes to this prayer, kneeing gale, so basically if you've got a husk god on Thunder Tusk in your army, you can give him one of the following prayers. There's three prayers to choose from, obviously. If you have more than one husk god on Thunder Tusk, each one of them can have a prayer, so you can have more prayers to choose from. But the Neen Gale is the best one, because this prayer is answered on a 4+. plus. If this prayer is answered, pick one for any monster or Mournfang pack unit wholly within 18 inches of the model, chanting the prayer. Until the start of your next hero phase, add free to that unit's move characteristic. Right, so you're getting this off on a 3+, plus now, instead of a 4+, plus, which is great. You're going to pick your Mournfang pack unit, then that's going to mean that they can move that extra 3 inches, and they're already running and charging, as long as obviously you've got them in range of that board edge, which, like I said, can be a bit of a pain, but is certainly manageable. And bear in mind that your base movement is 9, which I know is not the fastest movement, especially for cavalry. I sometimes look at my Varengard as being slow and their movement 10, right? But these guys have also got a musician, essentially, in their unit, which gives them a extra plus 1 to charge, which is useful. So, you know, you're running and charging, if you obviously make sure you do a swift flank. You're plusing 3 to your movement here, and I know it goes in a 3 up, so it's not guaranteed, but you know, you can say that about a lot of buffs in this game. So... You can make that your base movement is 12, and then you're running. Let's say the average you get, the low average is a 3, so then that's so then they've moved 15 inches, right? And then they're going to try and charge. And like I said, they get plus 1 to that charge. So let's say the minimum charge they can get is going to be a 3 at that point. So, you know, that's 18-inch movement, sort of like threat range. You can make their run an automatic 6, which then means that their movement has been 18 inches, and then they're making that charge, and then you can make them re-roll that charge. So there's a lot you can do here. You can do a turn one charge. The other thing I just want to compare it 
two is by talking about uh, a couple of battalions that could be useful and in particular one is my favorite right and i know that we've sort of like <laughs> started by talking about the allegiance abilities the sub allegiance abilities for the fundability so now we're sort of darting all over the book but honestly i think it's important to bring this up now because we're talking about the movement right so the first one is going to be the, apologies for how much I butchered this name, but uh, Yolbad, I think the J is like a Yol, so yeah, we'll go with Yolbad. So what this means is you need one Huskord on Stonehorn, two to four Mournfang pack units, and one to three Stonehorn Beast Rider. So it is tying you into, a, there is maybe a bit of tax there that you don't want to take, but I'll just read out what it does. So at the start of your hero phase, in the first battle round, each friendly unit from this battalion can make a move of d6. Roll separately for each unit. So like we said there, you could go minimum 21 inches, including the charge, and I think you got all the other buffs off. With this, add d6 onto that. You know, and when I said like, you know, minimum 21, that's a, if you've made yourself automatically run the six and you get the lowest possible to charge, which if you can get the reroll for charge there, absolutely um, you know brilliant let's say the average you would get on two dice is a seven and that's eight and then that's you know a threat range of like 26 inches at you know average if you get your buffs off with this it's an extra d6 on top which i'll be honest with you i haven't fought against the new like beast core raiders part of the ogre Moor tribes yet right and i know that might seem a bit strange to you but i think just because obviously how the world's been i haven't managed to play all those games so when I did my research into this video for the Y Play Thunderbellies, I kind of thought, wow, I didn't know this. If I went against them, I didn't know they could charge me turn one, just, you know, straight out. I maybe look at a Stonehorn and go, oh, that thing wants to charge me. But the Mournfang, bloody hell, like, you can do good work here. And I know, you know the old bad uh, might not be how you want to build your army, but you can help with drops as well, as you can pick quite a lot in here. So I think it's a nice addition. Um, I'm not saying it's the best thing, but I think it's something to worth consider from what I've read. And then you've got the um, uh, Earl Bad, I think that's how it's pronounced, ability. Uh, so essentially, I'll just read what you need. So you need exactly the same requirements as the last one. So one Huskord on Stonehorn, one to three Stonehorn Beast Riders, and two to four Mournfang Pack units, right? So... What you've got is Crush Mangle Tenderize. So if the unmodified hit roll for an attack made with a melee weapon used by a model from this battalion is a six, that attack inflicts one mortal wound on the target in addition to any normal damage. So that's good. You can throw out a lot of attacks with this army and you can do a lot of pain before you get any like mortal wounds of benefit like this. I think for me, I I prefer the movement one, but you may be thinking very differently and you may disagree with me because the movement one, just once per game, it just sort of helps you with that initial start of the game. It gives you that foot up, right? But the Elbad will help you all the way through the game, right? Because particularly if you're going against an army with really high armor state, you're going against, you know, Stormcast, you know, sometimes you have two up and roll on ones. Um, Idenf Deepkin, especially with Ishtan Guard at the moment, and let's say you don't really have much more wound output, you're going to need something like this. So it kind of depends who you're fighting against. Um, if it was me, I'd like to test out the Yolbad first, and then I'll go the Elbad next, just because I think that mortal wound output can be very good. I do like these battalions. Um, it can be a bit expensive as well, but I think it's worth giving a go. If you're like an experienced, you know, Beast Core uh, Raider player or a Mortarize player, and you go, no, 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 it's a trap. You don't want to go for it. Please let me know that in the comments, as we're all here to learn, as I always say. So I think that was just worth mentioning, right? So going back to the Thunderbellies More Tribe uh, sub allegiance abilities. The next thing we're going to talk about is actually going to be the command ability you get with it. So rip and tear. So you can use this command ability at the start of the combat phase. If you do so, pick one enemy unit with one or more wounds allocated to it. That is within six inches of a Thunder Buddy's hero. Until the end of the phase, you can reroll wound rolls for attacks made by friendly Thunder Buddy's Mournfang pack units that target that enemy unit. Right, so there's a big caveat to this, right? And that is because... The, uh, you need them to be wounded, which really depends on what army you find against. You know, if you find against an army that's practically all one wound models, um, and it's like a horde army, 
this is going to be barely useful at all, maybe to take down characters. But if you do go against those multi-wound armies that are increasingly coming about, even Stormcast, let's say you've got some Libertas or Secretas, one of them's taking one wound, that's enough. That's good enough, right? You can do it as long as you're within range. Because the nice thing is this is within six of your Thunderbelly uh, hero, not wholly within six, and it would just be ridiculous, right, to try and get off. But... As someone who, myself, I always play elite armies generally, or I fight against elite armies a lot of the time, this I can see as being very useful in my games, particularly if it was used against me. So I like it. The reroll wound rolls is really useful for your Mournfang, as they are wounded on freeze anyway. So rerolling that, you're guaranteed almost to get your wound through best you can. If there's a way to get a plus one to wound, that's even better. And with that, I'm going to talk about the Husk Gold on Thunder Tusk, which I think is a good one to add into your army, because he is a Blizzard Speaker, right? Which basically says that he's a priest, and then he can do one of these prayers, which the one you want to do is called the Winter's Strength, right? And this goes off on a 4+, plus, but you can actually add one to the roll for each other friendly Thunder Tusk unit within 18 inches of this model. So maybe if you want two of these in your army, you know, you can see some synergy there, but it can be quite an expensive way to do it but going off on a free plus would be great because we all can't be as spoiled as i think stormcasts do their prayers on a free up anyway but essentially so on a four up what you get to do is you've got winter's endurance that allows you to heal things which is good but winter strength is the one we're going to talk about now because if this prayer is successful pick one friendly beast score radio unit who live in 18 inches of this model until the start of your next hero phase, add one to wound rolls for attacks made with many weapons used by that unit. So now, like I said, it'd be lovely if you got plus one to wound. Here's how you get it. Not a guarantee way to go off. It's not like you just spend a command point and it's automatic, but it's a way to do it, right? So then you can get your re-roll wound rolls, wounded on twos, which, saying is how I run my Varen Guard, works really, really well with an ability like that. Okay, so... We've talked about that, right? That's one way. The other way, I'm going to say, how you can buff up your uh, Mournfang is actually going to be by taking a Huskord on Stonehorn this time, right? So, because the Huskord on Stonehorn, the nice thing about him is command ability, and this is a command ability, so you just burn a CP and you get it. And what you do is you pick one friendly Mournfang pack unit that made a charge move in the same turn that is wholly within 12 inches of this model with this command ability. If you use that unit's Mournfang charge ability in that phase, add two to the damage inflicted by an attack made with the unit's tusk instead of one. So essentially how it normally works is when the Mournfang pack unit charges, the tusks of the beasts are actually normally one damage, but they go up to damage two on the turn they charge. So now you can make that damage three on the turn they charge, and those ogres are swinging some pretty heavy hitting attacks as well on top. So... You can really see where this is uh, coming out quite well now. And then I also want to take us to, uh, if you take, I don't know, a Frost Lord on Stonehorn or a Frost Lord on uh, Thunder Tusk, you can get, you know, reroll charging for, you know, friendly Beast Squad Radiance holding within 12 inches of him, which is good because it can also give him reroll charges to charge, get the Stonehorn in or the Thunder Tusk, which can be very good. And then you can also add one to charge rolls of friendly Thunder Belly. Units that are while they're holding within 8 inches of this general, and that's the command trait of the Thunderbellies, which works out really, really well because we've already talked about how far your movement is and how far you can charge as well. And then all these other synergies and buffs of how to try and guarantee that charge for your Mournfang, even maybe turn one, get that charge in there as an alpha strike if you want, because it's hard to screen in this army unless you take Noblars or something. But if you're taking this army, I doubt you want to paint loads of tiny little grots. Otherwise, I don't know, you're going to Gloom's White Gits or something, right? And then the other thing you can do to make your charge even more impactful is the spell laws for the um, butchers of the army. So it means you have to take a gutbuster unit, which, you know, don't worry. It's not like taking an ally in a Beast Corps Raider army. This is all part of Ogre Moor tribes at the end of the day. But the spell that he has, which I like, is actually going to be Blood Feast, because Blood Feast is cast on phase 7, it's successfully cast, pick one friendly ogre unit that is not a monster, so it can be your Mournfang pack, and that is wholly within 18 inches of the cast and is visible to them. Add one to the attack characteristics of that unit's many weapons until the start of your next hero phase, which if you can get this off for your Mournfang is going to be great, right? Because your Mournfang, they're beasts, let's just start with their beasts, right? So. You get four attacks for each uh, like Mormfang that's attacking. 
and it's four attacks. Hitting on fours, not liking the fours there, but wounded on a three, like we said, we can get that to a two and re-roll those wound rolls. And minus one rend and one damage. But on the charge, with all the buffs, you can get up to three damage. So that's four attacks doing three damage. And then when it comes to what weapons you're going to give the ogres themselves, if you ask me, I'd say Gargan Hacker all day long. It looks the coolest. 100% free damage weapon as well. What's not to like and it's got rend? But it hits on a four. So I think the more competitive option, and again, if you want to disagree with me, please let me know in the comments down below. It would be great to hear your thoughts. It's probably going to be the Cunning Club or Prey Hacker because you still get free attacks of it. It's freeze and freeze. So there's no force to hit. You need a free, which is better, right? There's no Ren though, and it's only two damage. But I'm not going to lie, two damage is enough. And the nice thing about it is that if you roll a six to save with them, you're also going to get an Iron Fist if you arm them with these weapons. So that means that you're going to do that mortal wound back to the enemy if you get a six to save. And you don't get that with the Gargan Hacker. So that's why I'm thinking the Cunning Club. So you're making three attacks of this anyway. That's giving you an extra attack. So now you're per one, remember. This is just one in the unit. Um, your tusks are making five attacks each. And then if you go for the uh, Cunning Club or Prey Hacker, it's four attacks. And obviously you go with the Gargan Hacker, it's three attacks, right? And what I should say is that these come in size units of two and maximum size units of 12. And remember, they are going to be a battle line in your Moga War Tribes army. Uh, if your general is, of course, Beast Corps Raider, which you should do um, if you're taking them. A unit of 12 of them, I would love to see that, but that would just be too big, I think, and too easily tagged by the enemy and everything else. I think units of 4 are the ideal size, can pack a huge punch, but are still manoeuvrable enough and tactical enough to move around the board, right, and be wholly within 12 inches of that board edge for you to get your benefit. So, we've just talked about loads of buffs you can actually put on these guys. But there's just one more I want to talk about as well, right? which is actually going to be um, talking about one of the mount traits you can give these guys, right? Because the nice thing about your Ogre Moor tribes is you get mount traits, right? So it's no longer exclusive to just some armies, or actually it is still exclusive to some armies, but you get to be one of those armies. So, you know, fuck the other armies at this point. So what are you going to get for your mount traits? There is one from the Stonehorn mount traits, which is add one to charge rolls for friendly Stonehorn and Mournfang packs units while they are wholly within 12 inches of this model. So that means it's called the old um, Granite Tooth, I think it's called that. And basically it's number six anyway, in case I'm reading it wrong. And that's just helping out your charging even more, which is great. Cause that's not something you need to roll for. It's just a flat bonus you are going to get. Which means, to be honest with you, I've lost how many buffs we're getting for your charge in this army. But your movement can be so fast and your charging can be so good. Actually, you know what? Let's think about this, right? So you're moving 9, right? You can make it so they move 12. You can then make them run in charge. So let's say you want to make them run a flat 6. Uh, then they're moving 18. And then when it comes to charging... You can actually make them have plus three to charge because one from the command trait of the Thunderbellies, one from their War Scroll, this is obviously more than the pack we're talking about, and then one from the Mount Traits as well. So that means their minimum charge is a five, which means they can go right, they can like charge something minimum uh, 23 inches away from them. But obviously if you take them in the battalion, you get that extra uh D6 move, and I know we've gone over their attacks now, so you may go, oh, I want to do the Mortal Wounds one instead. Fair enough, you know, you're throwing a lot of attacks out there, so you could do that. But if you go for the movement one, that means on a 1D6, you're, you're going to go at least 24 at that point, which if I can get my mass right off the top of my head, which means that you're automatically getting, if your enemy deploys on the line 24 inches away from you, you've got that charge, which is cool. And that's kind of a minimum. But obviously the caveat to everything I've been talking about for the last 10 minutes or so is that you need to get all these buffs off, right? Some of them are command point dependent, but when you get your guys in, they can rip face if you get all the attacking buffs on them as well. They're not just going to movement, they're going to attacking, of course, aren't they? Which, of course, is the caveat. You can't guarantee getting all your buffs off. But from what I've learned of Ogre more Tribes, from what I've heard more like is, when I've done my research, they're quite a gambler's army. You kind of all in. So you either do amazing stuff and you get all the things off that I could, I've could i been talking about. Or it goes wrong, the enemy alpha strikes you, you don't get it off, you fail your rolls, everything else, right? So 
I think that kind of appeals to me, you know, and it may appeal to other people as well. That risk reward that instead of your army just going to go, it does all right, kind of all the time, or your army going, yeah, it does amazing, it wins every game because it's broken as fuck. This army is pretty cool because you can just throw everything forward and try and smash your enemy to pieces. Um, but it could backfire on you, right? But if you get your buffs off here, what I've actually heard with the Ogre Moor tribes is it kind of like relies on you getting the double turn. If you fail that, then the enemy charges you instead and you're in trouble. But you can charge turn one with these guys unless the enemy really backs up into a corner, which, you know, is going to be detrimental to themselves at that point. Um, yeah, I, I really like it. I think it's really good. Just to go over the artifact we've got is Shattered Stones. Enemy units treat terrain features within 12 inches of the bearer as having the deadly scenery rule in addition to any other scenery rule they may have. Okay, the least favourite one I've read, right? I mean, don't get me wrong. I played a game with deadly um, in the small tournament I did on my Discord uh, for the channel. And uh, yeah, that <laughs> deadly scenery is horrible. I was playing against a... I had Deacon player, and I think in our first uh, battle round, we probably took about 10 mortal wounds from deadly scenery because we were playing in the realm of beasts where everything was deadly, right? So it shows how good it can be, but it's I wouldn't pick this artifact from a list unless the other ones were diabolical, right? It's the weak part of this. It's the tax, if you like. But, you know, if you're taking one of the battalions, there's another artifact to choose from. And that really kind of comes to the end of uh, my strengths and weaknesses, I think, well, I've kind of combined in one in this. And you may be going, hang on, you just went on about a talk of Mornfang Pax for about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, something like that. And I did, but I told you, this is the Mornfang <laughs> sub-allegiance, right? I explained it in their law, and I'm explaining it in their rules, because if you want to take um, stone horns or anything else, you're probably going, uh, is it Boulderhead? The uh, one that's all about the monsters and beast race. This is all about your Mornfang pack. And I did talk about some of the other units that benefit you here. Obviously, there are other ways you can do if you don't want to go this way. But I think, to be honest with you guys, you voted for uh, Thunderbellies on the poll. And I have to tell you, that is the Mornfang one. That's how I feel I'd run it. Again, if you disagree with anything I say, please let me know in the comments as we are all here to learn, right? Like I say, I'm not the top expert on this army. I don't play this army, but I'm giving you my opinion after I've researched it. So I really hope this has helped you. Hopefully by discussing this sub in in quite a bit of depth, it's made you decide this is one you want to play. So it's made you decide if you want to buy some more Mornfang, to be honest. And that Star Collecting Box, I'm not going to lie, it's one of the most tempting ones I've seen as it's just five models. And I know it's like, well, you mean you're happy that it's less models for the price? Yes, because each one of those models is big, chunky models that are awesome, right? Um, so I really hope it's helped you make up your mind of it. What I'd also say is if you have enjoyed this video, please smash that like button we've got on the channel and also hit subscribe if you haven't already and make sure you press the bell notification if you haven't just so that means that you won't miss out a video that I'm going to make in the future. And I'm planning to make a lot more why play videos and how to start videos for certain armies going forward i think i can tell from you guys they're the most popular ones so i kind of want to focus on those ones going forward so make sure you won't miss out on any videos like this if you'd like to watch them what i also want to say is a massive shout out to my patrons as because of them honestly they make me be able to continue this channel and try and make as many of these videos to try and help as many people with age of sigma as possible so they always deserve a shout out and this is going to be to my Morgas, which are sam back jonathan h Philco and Bleed Red, my vampires who are Mir, Martin S, Rouse 321, David A, and of course my necromancers, which is Jack L, Radiation Riley, Dice Sagas, Wolf Nick, Michael W, Quad, and the Cranky Wombat. So what I also want to say there is actually we've got two of them are brand new, and this is going to be Bleed Red, who's became Morgar. So mate, with that join in and at that tier, again, like I always say for Morgas. Honestly, you guys, you're making such a huge difference in me being able to continue this forward. So thank you a lot, Bleed Red. And then, of course, the Cranky Wombat, who has been on the channel a few times in the comments and everything on my video. So thank you very much for becoming a patron, mate. I greatly appreciate it. And I know you've been wanting to know good. So hopefully you've enjoyed this video. And if you haven't, I'm sure you let me know in the comments. But um, no. So guys, thank you very much for your support. What I'd like to say is if you would like to consider becoming a patron, you'll find a link to my Patreon in the top of the description down below. As I honestly say, you know, I'm not lying about this. 
Because of my patrons, I can continue doing this. If I didn't have my patrons, I wouldn't be able to essentially just justify the time uh, making these videos, especially now that I've got a new editing software. I'm spending a lot more time on the video to try and make them always feel and look more professional and just make better content, basically, essentially. So if you'd like to check out, and even if you just give a dollar a month, I would be hugely appreciative um, and you would be doing a great thing to keep the channel going. So anyway, I'll leave that with you. If you don't want to, like I said, just smash that like button if you enjoyed the video and leave a comment if you've got any more questions or anything you think that I said and you agreed with or anything that you disagreed with, as it'd just be great to have that conversation with you so we can all learn a bit more. So with that, guys, all I'm going to say is thank you very much for watching. I look forward to seeing you in the next video. And remember until next time to stay safe, wear a mask, stay hygienic, wash your hands so we can all start gaming again soon and maybe even see some Thunder Bellies on the table. That would be even cooler. But of course, even more importantly, remember that Nagash is all and all is one in Nagash.